Coming up, a major shakeup at EAA. Hear directly from the new boss on what it means. And the deal between Hawker Beechcraft and a Chinese company falls through. We'll tell you what happened. Plus a look ahead at NBAA, and we chat with the world's first commercial astronaut. It'll be live this week, begins right now. Two major stories this week, a shakeup at the top of the Experimental Aircraft Association, and the deal to sell Hawker Beechcraft to a Chinese company falls apart, but Beechcraft keeps the money. We have exclusive reports on both of these stories. Thanks for choosing AOPA Live this week. I'm Tom Haynes. We begin in Oshkosh. Two years after taking office, Rod Hightower is out as the president of the Experimental Aircraft Association. Monday, EAA officials said Hightower had resigned to return to his family in St. Louis. Former Cessna CEO Jack Pelton is the new chairman of EAA's board, and he'll lead the association during the search for a new president. I talked yesterday with Pelton about the new direction for EAA. Well, con congratulations, Jack, on your new role as chairman of EAA. What do you see as your biggest responsibility in that new role? Well, I think, you know, immediately what I'm trying to do is make sure that all the stakeholders, you know, starting with employees, our members, our volunteers, uh, and our, our major supporters of, of EA are getting uh, reached out to, to let them know, you know, what's going on with this transition, why the transition, what the board decisions are, uh, and then also reassuring that same, same group and along with uh, outside sources like you that, you know, we're not changing EA's direction. It's, it's purely a leadership change. Uh, we're still committed to making sure this organization supports uh, all aviation enthusiasts. And uh, that, that is the direction we're headed in. How do you intend to reassure the experimental group that uh, EA is still there for them while at the same time seeming to need to broaden that base of support? Part of the, the uh, role I have to do is reach out to that group of EAA members uh, and reassure them that they're not going to get disenfranchised as EA looks at ways to continue to grow. We've been very open in, in our mission and statement that uh, while we, we are very proud of our heritage of being founded as builders, um, we're also a group that represents all aviation enthusiasts. We're a, we want to be a very inclusive organization, and uh, you know that's not going to change. And it's a tough environment for all of us. We we do have a pilot population concern. We have you know a lot of other concerns, but uh, I hope that together EA and AOPA can work to help uh, build the bridges that are necessary. Of course, this sudden change at EAA surprised many of us. AOPA President Craig Fuller said all of us at AOPA were saddened to learn of Rod Hightower's resignation as president of EAA. During his tenure, AOPA and EAA enjoyed an unprecedented level of collaboration that has served members of both organizations well. Our associations have committed to working together to protect general aviation interests, promote general aviation safety, and grow the GA community in the United States. Well, moving now to Wichita, the drama around the Hawker Beechcraft bankruptcy continued this week when company executives announced that a deal to be acquired by a Chinese company was off. CEO Steve Miller instead said the company plans to emerge from bankruptcy on its own as Beechcraft Corporation. The throwback name is an indication of the company returning to its roots as a producer of propeller-driven aircraft. Miller says the Hawker line of jets will be sold or shuttered in coming months. Now, you recall that HBC entered bankruptcy in early May and then accepted a $50 million deposit from Superior Aviation Beijing. That money meant to continue operations while the Chinese company evaluated HBC for possible acquisition. While analysts were skeptical right from the beginning that Superior could pull off the $1.79 billion deal, and it turns out they were right. Miller says the deposit is non-refundable, although there are reports that Superior may sue to get it back. Meanwhile, HBC Chairman Bill Boister says the new Beechcraft will focus on its Piston, Baron, and Bonanza line and the King Air turboprops, as well as military trainers. Numerous companies had expressed interest in parts of HBC. Stay tuned on this one. HBC will file a new bankruptcy plan with the courts in the next couple of weeks. It says will, it will repay in cash what it has used from a $400 million credit line and propose a new funding mechanism to emerge from bankruptcy in early 2013. Key creditors are expected to hold a big chunk of equity in the Beechcraft Corporation. And we hope to learn more at the NBAA show next week 
about the fate of the Hawker jetline. Regardless, we Beechcraft owners are happy to see that storied name back on the company. But this one's far from over. We're learning more about the future of simulation-based flight training. Redbird Flight Simulations held its annual conference in San Marcos, Texas this week. The company brought together a few hundred flight schools and industry representatives to talk about Skyport. That's their flight training laboratory. The company has been doing a study of simulation-based flight training. One of the things that has come out was that students are getting their pilot certificates in an average of just 38 hours. That's about half what it usually takes. We'll have a full report on the, migra uh, the migration and the findings from Skyport in an upcoming episode. Well, coming up after the break, a preview of NBAA and Mike Melville stops for a visit. You're watching AOPA Live this week. It's been called the most sophisticated single-engine airplane ever, but to the people whose loved ones are alive today, it's called a lifesaver. The Cirrus Airframe Parachute System, only from Cirrus Aircraft. Okay, how many times has this happened to you? You taxi into an FBO at a good-sized airport, and they put you out in the North 40 somewhere. The guys in the Jet A guzzling heavy iron get the red carpet treatment, and you have trouble just getting anyone to pay attention. Well, one major FBO chain says no more. Signature Flight Support told us at the AOPA Aviation Summit that piston air engine aircraft and their pilots are important to them. The industry, especially on the piston side, it, uh, has had a lack of attention over the last decade, whether that's attention from Signature as a large FBO network or our politicians in Washington. Um, we've taken a look at that market and seen how underserved it was, saw the, not only the economic opportunity, but the cradle to grave that a pilot who flies a piston aircraft is also flying a jet air aircraft on the weekend or on the weekdays, um, and they're important to us in both aspects. Last year, we served about 50% of the uh, uh, Avgas gallons that we had served over a decade prior. During that period, Signature doubled in size. So you would have expected us to double in size in Avgas, and instead we had dropped in half. And the, certainly the market, although stagnant, didn't shrink that much. So one, there's an economic opportunity, but there's also a realization that every one of our customers is equally important, and a piston shouldn't be parked two blocks from the terminal. They can park right next to the front door, just like a jet customer. This year, we started encouraging all of our management and paying for them to get their certificates. We have about three, th three dozen management employees uh, somewhere in their process right now of getting their certificate. The origins of that is that um, I was talking to some managers within Signature and we were talking about understanding and being empathetic with our customer. 30 seconds waiting on a ramp for somebody to tell you where to park makes a difference. A lineman not there to open the door makes a difference. Getting inside and getting into the terminal and understanding you know, what you're paying before you arrive versus after you arrive all makes a difference. And the whole idea is about our management better understanding all of our customers. Well, the conventions aren't exactly back to back, but it sure feels that way. Next week, the NBAA holds its annual event, this time in Orlando. We'll be there, of course, to bring you the news, and we ask NBAA President Ed Bolin to preview what to expect. Yeah, we're really excited to be back in Orlando. We were in Las Vegas last year, so West Coast last year, back on the East Coast. We'll have a number of uh, uh, people uh, with the Tuskegee Airmen who will be out. We're going to pay tribute to them, uh, pay tribute to FedEx and, and their support of Orbis. So it really will be an opportunity to discuss policy as well as really celebrate aviation history. And of course, the new products and technologies involved in business aviation always go to the forefront at these types of events. You know, last year, for the first time, we had a light business airplane static display right outside the conference center. We'll do that again. We'll also have uh, even more space than we've ever had before in Orlando, uh, out at Orlando Executive Airport. A hundred airplanes will be on display out there. So it really is a great opportunity to meet with people in the industry, uh, discuss major policies, but also celebrate, see, feel, and touch airplanes and the technologies that are in them. We'll have a special edition of AOPA Live this week direct from the MBAA convention floor. Tune in next Thursday for that. Many pilots have opinions on integrating unmanned aerial systems into the airspace, but now other groups are speaking out, including the American Civil Liberties Union. They're concerned that law enforcement use of drones could violate citizens' privacy. This morning in Houston, the ACLU and others were expected to testify before a congressional field hearing at Rice University. Remember, if you have questions about unmanned aerial systems, 
You can take the Air Safety Institute interactive course called Unmanned Aircraft and the National Airspace System. You can find it at the link on your screen. There's trouble brewing in the southwest for seaplane pilots. The New Mexico State Agency that runs state parks is proposing to ban all seaplanes, including float planes and am amphibs, from the state parks system. New Mexico has very few suitable water landing sites, so every one of them is significant for seaplane travel and interstate commerce. The Bureau of Land Management is concerned that the rule could hamper aerial fi firefighting missions, for example. We talked with Seaplane Pilots Association President Steve McCahey via FaceTime. He says the reasons the state is giving for the move are not valid. Public safety is one of the major issues that they're bringing up. Um, as far as public safety is concerned, in a 13-year study, we've only documented three uh, seaplane incidences where seaplanes have come in direct contact with boats. Uh, conversely, in 2011 alone, the Coast Guard reported 8,000 uh, boating accidents, which resulted in 758 deaths. AOPA is working with the Seaplane Pilots Association, the Recreational Aviation Foundation, and the New Mexico Pilots Association to help stop the measure from passing. Well, when we come back, new ebooks from AOPA, and we talk with the world's first commercial astronaut. You're watching AOPA Live this week. There's a new way to get the content you enjoy. Two of AOPA Pilot Magazine's most popular features, Safety Pilot Landmark Accidents and Never Again, are being turned into ebooks. The Best of Landmark Accidents, Volume 1, covers much of what can go wrong from a pilot's perspective. The Best of Never Again, Volume 1, picks up and from more than 600 Never Again stories that have been published since the magazine began back in 1958. You can find the books at aopa.org slash ebooks. They work on all your devices. Well, digital readers are the future for the printed word, it seems. Is space the future for general aviation? Last week, the world's first private astronaut dropped by AOPA headquarters, and we asked him, is civilian space travel the future? I think it's going to be. Uh, you know, we're, we're working away at Virgin with Virgin to get uh, Spaceship Two to be carrying passengers. He's got a lot of people who have paid money to, to fly with him. And uh, we've been doing a lot of flight test of uh, the, the mothership as well as the spaceship. And currently they're putting the rocket motor into the airplane and uh, hopefully that'll, it'll become a real thing. And I think uh, certainly in 2013, somewhere near the end of that year, we'll be flying, for sure, we'll be flying with rocket motors and going to space. And very shortly thereafter, we'll be carrying six people at a time and flying as often as we can. So it's very real, you know, I've been out of the atmosphere myself three different times and I can tell you if you want to buy a ticket, it's the most exciting ride you'll ever do in your whole life. You know, enormous noise and shaking and lots of speed and, and then suddenly the blue sky gets darker and darker and snap, it's black. And you know, you turn yourself upside down and look back at the world and realize that it really is a sphere. You can see clearly the curvature of the earth but the colors and the textures that you're looking at down at the ground are so beautiful. You just, you can't take a picture of it, you can't describe it to anybody, you have to see it. So you should buy a ticket and go do it. <laughs> <laughs> my airplane was built in 1980. Uh, my wife Sally and I built it ourselves in and we started out literally uh, in a little tiny room and we worked on it every single day. And we got it all done very quickly because I built the prototype for Burt Rutan uh, myself, that was part of my education into, the, into his business, was to just build one. And so I built the prototype, I helped with the flight testing of that prototype. Then I liked it so well, I built my own one. So my one is the first one to fly that was ever built from the plans. And it's 32 years old now, it has 4,600 hours on it. It's been to Alaska three different times and it's flown once all the way around the world. So this is the first time I've been able to come to Frederick been a member for a long time, didn't even have any idea of, of how significant AOPA is, you know. I mean, I realize they put out a great magazine, and I know they do a lot of stuff for us. And I am just blown away by the type of people that work here that are so passionate about aviation. And that's what's going to keep it going, you know. 
Well, Mike had an amazing ride into space. He and Sally are a wonderful couple, and it was great to have them here at AOPA. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. Join us next Thursday when we'll be coming to you from Orlando, Florida. We'll have a complete coverage from NBAA. I'm Tom Haynes. Thanks for watching. Every Thursday, we are working to get you answers. The most experienced reporters in general aviation. Bringing you more details as they develop. The stories that affect you. We talk with our own safety expert. Every Thursday, AOPA Live, this week.